It's the Bob McCown Podcast, yours truly, Bob McCown, curiously enough. Um, the show featuring John Shannon. Yes, sir. And uh, here we go for another Monday. Um, I, I, by the way, I've got about 19 phone calls from uh, out-of-work uh, hockey coaches wanting to be on the podcast. Yeah. Look, well, you, you come on here, you get a job. <laughs> That's right. That's oh, sort of how... Um, we- what does it do for us though nothing not a damn thing <laughs> okay yeah, it is curious they come on for 40 minutes and they get, get work it. and sure. we're still sitting here uh, by the way I, I would say and if anybody wants to listen to the bruce boudreau uh interview we did a, a, a couple of weeks back he was very good but it was a very good job interview i thought we asked him very good questions about how to coach a team well, that was what was interesting about it. And all the times we've, we've chatted Gabby, this one focused, and I don't think it, not intentionally, but it just curiosi- curiously focused in on how do you coach? What's your philosophy? What are you trying to do? What's your relationship with the captain? Do you talk to the blah, 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 blah. Where blah, are blah, you blah. with analytics? Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'd love to know from a personal standpoint, and I would imagine you would too, whether Mr. Aquilini in Vancouver actually caught the podcast I, I, I bob i don't think we'll find that out no but i don't i i wouldn't put a lot of stock in that i'm not putting any stock in it yeah it would just be really interesting we could start charging guests to come on here It'd be like Ooh. like a job interview good idea fifty thousand dollars you can come on the show and you'll get a job um we're we're not going to give out any jobs today uh, I don't suspect they, these guys don't need them. Dave Hodge and Steve Simmons on a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about Gabby and uh, the, his hiring with Vancouver and um, maybe some football, maybe some baseball. We'll see. Hodge and Simmons join Shannon and yours truly after these messages. Well, many places to start with our guests today. Well, we can go almost to any place we want to go, but there's a few items on the agenda that uh, need to be addressed. Dave Hodge, Steve Simmons with us uh, today. Well, let's start with the news from yesterday out of Vancouver, where the flailing Canucks finally uh, dismissed over the weekend, their uh, coach and general manager, and to date have hired our pal uh, Gabby Boudreau as the head coach. And, And Gabby was on with John and I, when about 10 days ago john 24th yeah and um got a very interesting conversation about his style of coaching etc etc good hire bad hire what do you think david well uh, i guess he's a he's a turnaround specialist he's been a few places and um they're looking for for uh something quick that could be called um, an improvement um, I think the feeling is that the team is is better than it has shown. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, they weren't yelling fire green or fire the coach. They were yelling fire Benning, a guy who has acquired uh, through the draft players like Pedersen and Besser and Quinn Hughes, um, players who would be coveted by every other team in the NHL. And yet, the fans wanted the general manager fired, and I gather uh, that they're smart enough to know that they weren't going to get the coach fired unless they got the general manager fired because the general manager wasn't going to fire the coach. So bizarre in Vancouver is uh, <laughs> sort of uh, normal over the years, and um, they've got a whole brand new scheme of things, and they got to try and get those players, well, Besser and, and Pedersen for sure, to play to their capabilities. And I guess that's Boudreaux's first assignment. Obviously the move, not surprising Steve in the least, maybe only surprising that it took as long as it did, but do you think Gabby is the right guy? I don't know who the right guy is until I know who the general manager is. Um, Bad organizations seem to operate badly all the time. And the Vancouver Canucks are one of those in, in what might be the most crazed and, uh, crazed hockey market in the country mm-hmm. and it may be the angriest hockey market in the country. Um, but when you, and I like what Montreal did last week, they put somebody in charge at the top and they said, okay, everything's going to filter down from Jeff Gordon. He's now the guy he's going to hire a GM. He's going to hire the next coach. You don't hire a coach 
before you have a general manager, before you have a team president, whatever, however you're going to structure your organization, the first decision starts at the top. Then he hires the GM. Then he hires the coach. I'm a big Bruce Boudreaux fan. I just think this is a ridiculous move again by Mr. Aquilini. Well, if you had to describe uh, Bruce's coaching style, um, Steve, what would it be? Comfortable. Um, com he's a guy you want to play for. He's a guy you want to be around. He's a guy that players like playing for Bruce Boudreaux. And it shows. Look, look at his record everywhere he goes. I mean, if he had a really good playoff run, which he hadn't had, but if he had one of those, he would be one of the, you know, the elite coaches of the last 20 years. If you look at where, what he's done everywhere he's been, uh, he's, he's more relaxed than, than the average NHL coach is. And he's less <laughs> detailed, I think, than the average NHL coach is. And I think that makes players a little more at ease, which players will like. I think the Vancouver players will like playing for him. But to be honest, I thought Travis Green, I still think Travis Green is a heck of a good hockey coach. He just got caught in a situation that was, was an avalanche running down the mountain and he was just run over by it. But every well, time you say, every time you say everywhere he's been, referring to Boudreaux and all the places he's coached, um, it does suggest that it's pretty hard to call him uh, elite. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he's been hired a bunch of places, but that means he's been fired a bunch of places. And he's not the long-term answer in Vancouver. He knows that. Everybody knows that. Um, he's, what, 66 years old, and he's got Scott Walker as his assistant, who may well be uh, the next uh, Canucks coach. So they're looking ahead of Bruce Boudreau, when they make this, uh, when they make this move, but as I say, uh, their elite players uh, have been. Well, Besser has been terrible, and if they want to trade him, you know, it'll be a long line to to uh, get to the phone. Um, but the idea is to get him scoring goals. And Pedersen, who you know shoots the puck, not quite like Austin Matthews, but you know he, he's got he's got a great shot. He's got four goals, um, so. As I say, Bruce Boudreaux is going to look at those two guys and say, I got to get them scoring. And uh, if I do, uh, then um, we'll be on the way to better things. And if I don't, um, they're going to continue to trail the Seattle Kraken. I mean, when you're, when you're behind an expansion team in the standings, um, you're, you get trouble. I don't want to dwell on the, on the Boudreaux thing, but the one interesting thing I'm intrigued in your response to both of you is the notion that Boudreaux, I mean, this is a guy, I think he was the fastest coach to 300 wins in history, or at least one of the fastest. He's got a winning record every place he's been, Minnesota, Anaheim, Washington, but he's got a sub 500 record in the playoffs and mm -hmm. has won a cup. And that's what everybody kind of points to all the time. Is that the ultimate analysis here? that it doesn't really matter what you do during a regular season. Um, it, it, it comes down to what you do in the playoffs, Stevie. Well, first of all, if you're Vancouver, it matters what you do in the regular season because there you ain't going to get to the playoffs unless you're doing well in the regular playoffs. season. Yeah. And so, you know, so you, you bring him in as, as Dave pointed out, hopefully he can get Pedersen going. Hopefully he can get Besser going. When I first saw Pedersen play, I thought we were talking about one of the elite, elite players in the NHL. I thought we were talking about a top 15 guy for the next 10 years. When I watched him play in the first 15 games of this season, uh, I didn't even know who he was. Mm -hmm. Like That's how far he's fallen off the map from where he began. And, and so for Bruce, it's not so much getting to the playoffs. It's getting this team to play the kind of hockey with the upper level talent they have that they are probably capable of playing in a rather easy division. That's what people haven't pointed to. If you want to be in a division where you can, you, you should be able to win. It's, it's that Pacific division with, with the three teams from California, all of whom trying to reinvent themselves. And so you're, you know, you're in that situation. That's where Vancouver, you know, Vancouver's fall is even more frustrating. There's an expansion team and three California teams in your division. 
Well, they're uh, all they're all better than anybody thought they'd be, though. Uh, yeah, but, but starting, not, starting with, nonetheless, starting with Anaheim. they're uh, they're way worse than they were supposed to be. The Canucks. No, no, no. I'm I'm saying that those four weak teams aren't as weak as they okay. were supposed to be. Arizo Maybe, Arizo Arizona is. Arizona's in another division, though. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> is, is it is it fair to say uh, that uh, Bruce Boudreaux's coaching style uh, lacks uh, depth, and that um, you know for a while his his approach is welcomed in the dressing room um, and on the ice, but it goes only so far. Because I think we have to try to explain why he has left all of these places that he apparently uh, had some success uh, at the beginning. Well, I think the only place he had a team where he should have done something with was Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that Anaheim team was something that was going, they, they were going to do much. He doesn't have the Minnesota, this is not the Minnesota Wild, of, you know, he, Bill Guerin's Minnesota Wild. Guerin's no. a marvelous job of re making that team and make they play like Bill Guerin. I mean, it's fascinating to watch that team. Um, so I, I don't look at his failures in the playoffs other than in Washington. And if you look, a lot of people failed coaching the Washington Capitals, except for the, you know, the one Stanley cup they have. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not going to condemn him for teams that shouldn't have been, playoff teams or it shouldn't have been successful i don't know how good the wild were i don't know how good the anaheim ducks were well the ducks were pretty good and and memory serves me they were up 3-1 in a conference final uh to chicago um no chicago was i think the better team but uh the the the, the, the quick turnaround i think that dave touched on i i i i think that speaks more to um what the Canucks are and what the Canucks think they need more than anything else. I mean, Dave, you've lived in the market. I understand the market, I think. Um, and it is a, it is a, and, and Steve's point about passion in the market is really valid. This is a town that there are, if there are 200,000 people watching hockey on television every night, there are 200,000 general managers and there are 200,000 coaches uh, and they don't understand what Travis Green and Jim Benning did wrong and why they did it and think it's an easy fix. And I, and, and I, I do think this is an ownership group. Uh, and Dave, you can talk about the passion of the fam of the, uh, the fan. Um, I do think the ownership group bends to the fan a lot in Vancouver, almost more than anywhere else. Well, you know, when a Jersey hits the ice and, um, and the chance start, uh, you, yeah, you, most owners would uh, would probably take notice. But you said there's 200,000 general managers out there. There isn't a general manager in the Canucks office that <laughs> holds the permanent title. There's, there's Stan Smeal waiting for somebody to tap him on the shoulder and say, thanks for, for minding the store. And to get right back to Steve's first point, uh, this doesn't explain itself until we know who the Canucks next general manager is. And he's inheriting all that has gone on, and he's inheriting two Sedines and um, a lot of people who are sort of hanging around uh, to try to provide advice. And do you, you know, do you clear that out, or do you uh, make them a, a stronger voice uh, beyond the the GM and the assistant GM? I think uh, this is still uh, to be determined in terms of whether the Canucks have improved the situation or not. Um, and it was a bizarre way to, that it unfolded, obviously, on a Sunday when th this news trickled out. You know, as many people in our business who are able, and a lot of them in Vancouver, based right there, who, who get this stuff, you know, almost before it happens. And hardly anybody could figure out what was going on mm -hmm. until late Sunday night. It was determined that all of these changes had been made. And you still had to wake up this morning to confirm everything. Well, I, I've known people who have been the general manager or in senior management positions with the Vancouver Canucks. 
and then have worked for a variety of other NHL teams. I am told by the people who have worked for the Vancouver Canucks that there is no owner more difficult and more challenging to work for than Francesco Aquilini. He may be the most interfering owner in the NHL. So he, not only is he an interfering owner, he's a fan. And he listens to, like Harold Ballard used to go into grocery stores and listen to fans and then, and then act on what he heard while well, shopping oh, in an aisle. Well, no, no, but no, he didn't. <laughs> uh, but but or, or not act. But, but just to, get, to give you an example, uh, when Montreal made the change they made last week, they went completely outside their own operation and went to a guy who's already built one team that looks like it's going to be a contender for some time, and, it, and played a part in a Boston Bruins team that has been a contender for several years. So mm -hmm. th there's a long resume there with Jeff Gordon. The Vancouver Canucks always seemingly turn to the guy in the next office. This is how they hired Dave Nonis. This is how they hired Mike Gillis was just a voice in the background. Like they don't go and look around. They don't search the market. They don't hire the best people. And so what are they talking about now? Oh, let's let the Sedins go in. Well, what have the Sedins done other than be great hockey players? Stan Smeal, what has he done other than he was a captain of the Canucks? Like they, they go right back to all of their guys, their locals, you know, and this isn't it, a time for that. This is a time to find the best person you can find. Well, it, 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 in defense of Stan Smeal, Stan has been a, a, a and, and Stan's a friend. So Stan has been a great soldier for this organization for a long time. Uh, I can guarantee you in his, and he would never say this, but there's no way Stan wants to be the general manager. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that. But why? Stan is, Stan is there because Stan, is, Stan is there because the other 31 managers have to be able to call somebody at this point. How did Gord Stellick get the job as Leaf GM? Because Ballard looked over and he was in the next office. It's yours now. <laughs> That's not the way to operate. Well, so the, 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 your, your point about Montreal is a really good one, Steve, because what the Montreal situation, and I've, and I've heard it a few times since, um, really um, speaks of the influence of the commissioner's office. Because you know darn well Jeff Molson, who was in a, in a pickle, made a couple of phone calls and, pro and probably called the commissioner and said, hey, listen, here's what I'm doing. Here's what's happening. Who would you hire? And, and, and not that Gary sits there and dictates names, but Gary would get back to him and take, take some time and, and use his inner circle of people and then say, listen, this guy's good. This guy's good. And there's no question that Jeff Gordon would have been at the top of that list. I'm not sure Francesco would have made that call. And Gary pushes the same people. Almost like if you call him today and say, Gary, I need a general manager. He's going to say, how about Peter Shirelli or Kevin Weeks? Those will be the first names that come out of his mouth. That's just the way Gary operates. And probably Jeff Gordon was top of that list prior to last week. Mm. Um, um, when the Chicago Blackhawks um, phoned Gary Bettman and were told to hire Jeff Gordon, um, they didn't. No, but I think they were. I, I, I also think that the, 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 the Blackhawks situation was one that they said, you know what, we're going to limp through this season and we're going to reinvent next summer. I do think that that's what happened in Chicago. And I do think that Gorton was on their list. Uh, and when, when, and, and I do believe in, in my heart of hearts that Jeff was told that. Said, listen, if you want to wait until next summer, then maybe the job's yours. Yeah, actually, I think they didn't call Gary Bettman, they called Jimmy Dolan and he said, don't hire Jeff Gordon. <laughs> um, well, except, except, the interesting thing about you don't want to make the interesting <laughs> thing about that, Dave, is, is that if you call if, if you call Jim Dolan and he says don't hire him, what what Jim Dolan is saying is that I'm prepared to pay him for three more years or two more years so that he doesn't work um, because you know he's still on he's still on Dolan's payroll. Well, yeah. if, if, if Dolan says anything to me, I'm going to likely to do the opposite anyway, based on his track record. Um, I, I think, I think it, it, as far as Montreal goes, I think we still have to wait and see who the general manager, the French speaking general manager is. And uh, if, if Jeff Gorton is to be, uh, is to be believed, then the general manager is going to have the final say on, uh, on hockey dealings. And so 
while, while, while Gorton might be uh, a, a good idea at the time for the Canadians, um, I, I need to know who the general manager is and I need to know how long Ducharme is going to be the coach and is, or back to Steve's original point, that's got a lot to do with who the, who the GM is because all Gorton has said is that, uh, you know, he's not prepared at this time to make a coaching change. So Ducharme is there for the rest of the season, presumably. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't put a check mark next to the Canadians and say, uh, you know, things are all, all better because of the Gorton hire until I see how everything else plays out. Well, here, here's the thing, though, Dave, and this is why I'm not sure I believe when Jeff Gorton says the general manager will have final say. Um, you're seeing this a lot in baseball. Guys are moving into positions and they're not called general managers, just as Jeff Gorton is now. Um, David Dombrowski in Boston is not the general manager. Um, some of the other higher up people, Mark Shapiro is not the general manager of the Blue Jays. Um, but he, those guys are very involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Theo Epstein was not the general manager of the Cubs when he was there. He had, a, he had a fancier title. And so you're seeing more and more of that. You're seeing with Pittsburgh right now with Brian Burke and Ron Hextall. Um, senior people working together. And then, you know, they will determine who the coach is. I don't, I don't suspect Ducharme will be the coach when next season starts. But, but um, if, if Gordon is, has the final say in Montreal then the general manager will, in French, explain the move the Canadians have made and be explaining Jeff Gordon's move and not his own. I, or, I think it could be awkward. Or move they made, to, move they made together. I mean, you look well, at Ross Atkins does all the talking for the Blue Jays, for the most part. Mark Shapiro rarely speaks. You know, are you telling me that he has been signing these players for $100 million? I don't think so. I think it's a combination or Shapiro's leading the, the troops on this. He's well, the, sure. That's, that's common now in, in, in all of sports and the, and the title that has surfaced the last couple of decades. Aren't I guess, titles semantics? President of baseball operations or president of hockey operations. And it basically means I get to tell the general manager what I want to do or yeah. want him to do. In, in some scenarios. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that that's, I think, but in the end, the, the, the new general manager is, the old assistant general manager. Basically. I think there should be a trophy in the NHL in every <laughs> sport for best executive vice president of operations. Well, we <laughs> certainly everybody's, don't. Everybody's got three of them and who knows what they do. Yeah. And there aren't enough trophies in the national hockey league. I, I want to go back to S Simmons suggestion. Cause I think the next general manager of the uh, Vancouver Canucks will be the Sedine twins um, jointly. Uh, which will be the most interesting uh, scenario in history. I'm kidding, of course, but but they would work. Wouldn't surprise me. They would work well together, Bob. <laughs> and the fa the fans. See, here's the thing: yeah. the Vancouver fans would love that <laughs> for a while. They, they would like. Fans, they well, we'd all players. love it. I mean, it's a great story. But here's my the best God, players in franchise history. Yeah, you, know. you love it for a while until you until you lose ten in a row. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that, 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 that's that revisionist this, history. It, listen, this is a fan base that loved the Ekman Larson trade, loved the Scotty Garland trade, loved the signing of Quinn Hughes and Elias Pettersson. Uh, thought that Jim Benning finally did a good job of getting rid of some some dead contracts. J Jim Benning made made you know nine or ten changes to the roster this off season, and you know they looked pretty good on paper, and every fan said that. Do you know where they've never recovered from, John? And it's a two-year thing. They've never recovered from Markstrom leaving. When you watch that team well, in the playoffs, when they had that nice run a couple of years back, Markstrom was exceptional. Well, and he, you, was you, exceptional the whole, he was exceptional the whole season. In fact, I think I had him on my Hart Trophy. He might have been my fifth choice on the Hart Trophy ballot. You're um, not wrong. You're not wrong. And, and the other guy they actually they actually miss and because they're blue – is, is Chris Tanoff. Well, that was a huge loss. Yeah. Well, and especially to a team in uh, in their own division, the next yeah. province in the yeah. in the in the same division. Uh, there's there's no doubt about that. No, I mean the the Canucks do. We're talking about the Sedins. We're talking about Smeal. Let's not forget Trevor Linden. His name hasn't been mentioned. Um, bring back the the players that everybody cheered for when they wore the uniform and. They'll love the fact that they are working in the front office, but no, they don't uh, for very long. You right. Know what, 
We who, are, who, are the, we are, who are the general managers that you, you look around at, at sports and you say, oh, that guy's really good at his job. I mean, long term. Bill Lou Belichick. Lamarillo has been great at his job. And, Bill Belichick. Okay. Lou Lamarillo has been great at his job. Did he ever play in the, in the NHL? No. Did David Poyle play in the NHL? No. Did Bill Belichick play in the NFL? No. Uh, you, you can run through. A, did Doug Armstrong play in the NHL? Like, you don't have to be a player. To be a good, did Alex Anthopoulos play big league baseball? Like, a lot of really good sporting executives are just smart people who know how to operate and have vision and can, can make deals and can make mm -hmm. trades and can understand. I, I hate the word because we hear it way too often roster construction. But you have to understand that. And the guys who are successful year after year after year are people who do that. And most of them, in pro sports, sometimes they're not, but most of them are not ex players. Uh, well, it's firing season, and um, following Vancouver's decision, the Philadelphia Flyers have fired Alain Vignon as uh, their head coach. Uh, that story breaking as we sit here and discuss. And that can't be a surprise given the way the Flyers have played the last no. what, three weeks, huh? Not at all. Not at all. And and I'm sure this by the time uh, everybody listens to this, the short list is short. I think it's two guys, either Rick Tockett or John Tortorella. Well, we will uh, we will see soon enough. Uh, right. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll chat um, maybe a little football, maybe a little baseball uh, with uh, Dave Hodge, Steve Simmons, back after these messages. It's McCown, it's Shannon, it's Hodge, it's Simmons. Boy, you're good with the breaking news, Bob. That was good. Happy to help, John. <laughs> um, I, 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 we don't talk much about the Canadian Football League on this program, and sometimes I feel like we should, and sometimes I feel like, well, I'm not obligated to talk about something that uh, the majority of the country, perhaps, doesn't pay that much attention to. But no, the majority of Southern Ontario. Well, Quebec. Oh, I, I tell you what, when you, the, I haven't seen the ratings for yesterday's games, but I guarantee you that there'll be, one will be over a million, the other will be close. That's a pretty good number, Bob. Well, it's a pretty good number, relatively speaking, I guess, but this is a country of almost 40 million people. That's not a whole lot of people. There's a lot of, a lot more people that are disinterested than are interested. Nonetheless, Bombers won a good game uh, in, in um, um, uh, an entertaining game. And I guess to some extent, you could say the Ty Cats and Argo game was somewhat interesting. Simmons was actually there. And you say, what, 21,000 in the, in the building? That's what they announced. They first announced around 18, I think, or 16, 16 something. And then they corrected it about five minutes later. But well, people crashed. 5,000 mysterious like, people showed up. or what? I don't know who does their you know, math or how they come up with these numbers Close. anyhow. But because because on Saturday they had said they'd sold over 18,000 seats and then they announced 16. So it seemed weird. And then about 10 minutes later, they corrected that number oh. and got to 21. They haven't had a lot of practice counting that high, Steve. Which had looked, none. To be honest, it. that's what it looked like. The one side was completely full as it usually is. And the other side, which is almost completely empty, uh, was about half full. So... That, well, this that is a team that had its worst attendance record in history, and that's saying something, because this is the Toronto Argonauts. And I just want to throw this out because it, it did come out in uh, the last couple of weeks, the notion that MLSE, who did almost nothing to promote this team, whether they should have or shouldn't have, may have had enough. Any, th any thoughts on that? Do you, is that even possible? that MLSE may say, we give up? Well, MLSE, when the CFL was in talks with the XFL last off season about some kind of a merger yes. or some kind of a financial arrangement or whatever it was going to be, MLSE was the most engaged of the nine CFL teams in that process. As time went on, most of the other teams lost interest. Toronto never did. Um, and so clearly Toronto's looking for some kind of an answer to their problem. Having said that, Dale Lastman from Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, Larry Tannenbaum's right-hand man, is chairman of the board of the CFL. He also talked his best friend or one of his two or three best friends, Gary Stern, into buying the Montreal Alouettes. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine 
unless Gary Stern and Dale Lastman are both taking their football teams to whatever is going to be the XFL in a year from now, that, uh, that, that he's going to be leading a charge to, to pull up the Argonauts when he's talked his buddy into buying the team down the road. Um, you know, that's, that's not how this group of friends would operate. Is that, David, um, are, are you convinced the XFL will actually play? Um, I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. You know. I, um, I, I'm here because I've spent a decent chunk of my career criticizing the Argos after losses. So um, I'm quite happy to uh, talk about the game that Steve attended and wonder why in the world a team that is at home a prohibitive favorite, um, stopping everything Hamilton can do uh, early in the game in the first half of the first quarter, uh, kicks a field goal um, from 10 yards out. And then the next time they get that close to the goal line, they kick another field goal to go up six to nothing. Uh, it just, it's, he's a first year coach. You might be the coach of the year. But um, I'm saying, what in the world does this do for the confidence of, of the quarterback who's under pressure anyway? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yet, at halftime, it's 12 nothing, And you think, you know, they don't need 11 of those points, perhaps, the way Hamilton's going. But everything changes with the quarterback change um, for the Ticats and the Argos blow a game that they should have won. But as I say, um, you're down, you know, it's third down. You need three yards to get in. Um, you're either going to score a touchdown or they're going to stop you and you're going to stop them and get the ball back or they're going to give you two, two points by conceding a safety. The, the idea of those two first field goals, I think, sort of um, has to be looked at in the end result and say, things might have been very different if the coach had just done what any other coach I think would have and should have done. What, what, we're, what we're seeing in the NFL right now, more mm -hmm. than ever before, is teams going on fourth down, fourth and two, fourth and three. There, there is less punting. There are fewer field goal attempts uh, when you're that close in, in, in NFL games now. You, you know, and I think the analytics have really come to show that it makes sense, as Dave points out, not to be kicking those short field goals. And I, and I tweeted at the time after the second one that this is going to come back and bite them. And it came back and bite them. It should have been 20 nothing or so at halftime. And, uh, and I think at that point, if it's 20 nothing at halftime, Hamilton's not coming back from that. Can I, can I give you the weirdest fourth down gamble uh, that I've ever seen in the NFL? It happened yesterday. And it happened uh, during a game that the Detroit Lions won, mm -hmm. obviously, their first win of the season. Um, and if you weren't watching, I'll quickly try and give you the scenario because it is mind boggling. The Lions are leading by two points with just over four minutes to play. And they're on their own 28-yard uh, line, fourth down and one. You're up two. There's not that much time left. Are you gambling on your own 28 yard line? They did. They didn't make it. They in fact fumbled. And the Minnesota Vikings took two of those remaining minutes to go in and score a touchdown to lead by four. And the Lions then get the ball on the kickoff at the uh, 25 yard line with two minutes to go. And they're trailing by four points. And the Detroit winless Lions march on 16 plays in those last two minutes to score a winning touchdown on the final play. This after a coach has gambled inside his 30 yard line with the lead and four minutes left. And somehow we're, he's it not remembered out. for that dumb play. They are remembered for finally getting a win. I just, it's, you shake your head. Well, that, that may in part tell you why they had won zero games before yesterday. <laughs> no, they were playing the Vikings. I think that probably had something to do with it as well. Well, I guess. Um, one of the things that happens here as a result of the Argonauts' uh, futility to put it in the end zone in the first half is that uh, the Ticats now get to host the Great Cup. And I saw yesterday 
promos for tickets being available in Hamilton. And there's less than 500 available. Apparently they're sold out. They've announced a sellout this morning. Well, and that's, yeah, but do they announce that sellout if the Argonauts wind up winning that game? So it didn't hurt the CFL and didn't hurt attendance and perception, I guess. Uh, it's, for astounded next me the last, it's astounded me the last few years what they have charged for Grey Cup tickets, what people have paid for them. You know, you're paying to watch to watch something that you can watch comfortably in your home. A lot of money in cold weather to sit outside. Um, the attraction of that, I've never quite. I love Grey Cup week. Mm-hmm. I don't as a, if I was a fan would not love Grey Cup Sunday outside of my own house. All right, so, but Dave, uh, can you give us a, a, a big uh, synopsis of the playlist for the Arkells at halftime, though? Uh, and the Lumineers. So, you know, there are people who, who are tweeting that there's a football game as well as the Arkells concert, concert. <laughs> next, next, uh, ne- next Sunday. Um, I, I don't know how enthusiastic the fans are. Uh, yeah, if it's sold out that they're enthusiastic enough uh, to do that. Um, but let me say this, and anybody that watched either or both of those games yesterday, um, after a, a year off from, from playing in the Canadian Football League, the players were, some of them were out of their minds. Yeah. Uh, you know, emotional to the point where they were, you know, they, some of them would rather fight than, than play, especially the guys on the losing side. And it was, um, it, it had to have something to do with the fact that the, these guys have not, have not played in, in two years and were so desperate, A, to play and B, to win, that they kind of lost it when they knew they were uh, losing the game. I guess I understood it, but um, it didn't look good when it got out of hand. Well, it wasn't a good look for the Argos post game when wow. one of their players, I think, got into a fight uh, in in a corridor with a Hamilton fan. I don't know all the details, but it, allegedly the fan spit on them. I spit saw them. I saw video of an altercation. I also know that McLeod Bethel Thompson, who who did not uh, show up for the post game uh, media availability which is unusual because I, I can't recall a quarterback ever not showing up for that at a, at a, whether it be a conference final in the CFL or a AFC NFC final in in the NFL or whatever this is what quarterbacks do they talk after games they show up apparently McLeod Bethel Thompson pushed the cameraman oh and there was no there was that finger. very evident on television yeah I, I didn't he, see that because yeah. I was I was in the corridor at the time yeah but you know, I was, I had a, an argument with one of the CFL's um, media relations people after the game saying this is, it's inexcusable for a quarterback not to show up post game to, to explain, or especially in his case, because he had been in quarantine for, for the previous three days and there was some possibility that he wouldn't even be playing. And there was lots for him to be asked about. And he, he chose, he chose or the team chose or somebody chose not to have him available. Uh, I, 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 I wouldn't blame the argument. I, I, I just based on what we saw after the game and his interaction with the TSN cameraman, Steve, I would suggest the Argonauts uh, lost control of their quarterback. Yeah. Are we ever going to know uh, all of the details, all of the answers to the questions you might have asked, Steve? And, and it sure- doesn't begin and end with the with the quarterback. Obviously, the team, the league. Um, a lot of people uh, need to be uh, further explaining uh, what happened and why decisions were made. And I guess, do we wonder whether this had any effect on, on uh, Bethel Thompson uh, during the game? I, I don't know. It did, obviously, at the end of the game when he didn't do what he should have done. But Well, I have asked so many people so many questions over the past three days, and this is like nobody wants to address anything. Just to you're give you talking a- about them going to the basketball game on Thursday. five players, five players. Yeah. So what happened was somebody informed the producer of the Raptors game um, Thursday night. Somebody informed Dave Leader that he they would be interviewing McLeod Bethel Thompson, I think at halftime or sometime during the game on camera and he had his daughter with him 
Um, uh, and now leader will not talk. He, he forwards you to the PR person from Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment who will not talk on the record, who then forwards you to someone else who will not talk. Um, Pinball Clements being Pinball Clements, of course, saying it's all my fault. Yeah, it falls on his sword. Yeah. I don't think, I think he knew uh, something about it, but he, it wasn't his decision. My, if I can piece all this together as best I can, somebody in the promotions side of MLSE decided, you know, we don't ever do enough cross promotion. Here's a chance maybe to sell some tickets. Let's get our quarterback on the basketball game where a different group of fans are watching and see if, you know, maybe that's some good promotion, cross promotion, something that, that they've been accused of not doing. So they did it. And it of course blew up in their faces. And then the CFL had to make a call. Do they stick to their policy or do they alter it accordingly? Now, what I was told is that they have a group of medical people who go over their situation and what they determined was the policy was basically written before arenas opened up before stadiums opened up before some of the covid restrictions were lessened and so they looked at it and said that the four-day quarantine wasn't necessary if mcleod bethel thompson and the others i think only two of them played um uh tested uh, three times or four times prior to the game and came up negative each time they would get to play. And that's what happened. So, but the Hamilton Tiger Cats weren't happy that the CFL changed its, their own rules. And I think other teams in the league were not happy, but I mean, if you go back years and years, they've been changing rules for the Argos about as long as the CFL has been around. Doug Flutie got signed for a million dollars a year in Toronto when, when teams were only being paid a little more than 2 million. Um, so this is a, this is just another way of placating the Argos, but frankly, I could make an argument on either side of this decision and, and, and go with it quite easily. Well, um, when we say that, uh, you know, the, the, everything looks and turns out pretty well for the CFL when the home team, uh, is on its own field, Hamilton. Um, trying to get revenge in a, in a rematch with uh, the defending champions, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And I guess perhaps you could say that the CFL is breathing a sigh of relief that the Tiger Cats are playing in the game and the Argos aren't for the, uh, for the reason that if McLeod Bethel Thompson and the Argos wind up holding up the Grey Cup, um, people are going back and saying, Perhaps he shouldn't have been eligible. He wasn't eligible officially to be in the semifinal, in the Eastern final that took him to the Great Cup. So it's all that's off the table as far as the CFL is concerned. And I'm guessing that they're just as happy that they've got the matchup that, uh, that exists. Well, there's one other thing they're happy about, guys. Um, Dane Evans came in and saved the Tiger Cats yesterday. Twice, or twice, Steve. Yeah. Once on the once on, once on the turnover and the fumble recovery. So one one would suspect that he will start at quarterback this coming Sunday. Um, the starting quarterback normally for the Tiger Cats is Jeremiah Mazzoli. Word is he's not vaccinated. So the CFL would have to be answering questions all week long about an unvaccinated quarterback when it's possible that unvaccinated players and or player on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers will not be allowed to travel to the game because of their COVID re regulations and because of uh, travel uh, regulations. And so how would it look if the team from out West can't bring their non-vaccinated player, but the other team is starting the non-vaccinated guy at quarterback? So the CFL got a break on two fronts yesterday. Well, this is very typical of the Canadian Football League, though. I mean, you know, the rules are the rules when, when, until they they aren't the rules anymore. And the issue isn't necessarily the CFL saying, "Well, we we put in the four day quarantine thing when arenas or stadium were were empty or half full." But those players who went to the basketball game, including Bethel Thompson. 
neither knew or should have known that those rules were in place at the time. And if they didn't know, then that's the responsibility of management. And I'm not sure that it's Pinball Clements that should have done that. It was not a secret that they were going. Somebody should have piped in and said, you can't go because right. blah, blah, blah. You're right. But, right? Actually, but maybe somebody piped in and said, we'd like you to go for promotional purposes. Well, and, and, and this that, is, this, this oh, is I where, I, Dave, this is I, where, I, I don't this disagree. Is where, uh, this is where uh, the power of MLSE is supposed to help the CFL. Um, and it's supposed to be, you know, in many ways, I, I could actually imagine either Dale Lastman or even Larry Tannenbaum saying, hey, we should get the football guys because they both love the game and need to promote the Argos. They, I think there's a belief that for, for particularly for those two guys to promote the football club. And it's on the game was the basketball game was on TSN, who's carrying the football game. There's there's a lot of logic to it. It's just that it didn't didn't comply to the CFL rules. Well, well I, I love the fact that right after McLeod Bethel Thompson was seen at the Raptor game, uh, Brandon Banks from the Hamilton Tiger Cats, one of the more interesting players in the CFL, tweeted, you know, I, tr I wanted to go to a Raptors game and, and they told me I couldn't go. Like, yeah. what the, there you what, go. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, back back to the uh, back to the game for just just a minute. Um, it, uh, why the TSN turning point doesn't exist anymore? I have no idea. I think it's the best idea that that network ever had ever uh, to close every game with. And oh, by the way, here's the TSN turning point, which fans still uh, still say to themselves uh, in discussion. Uh, that was the TSN turning point. The brand is still there. TSN doesn't want to bother using TSN turning point. But how many 92-yard punt returns for touchdowns do you see in the Canadian Football League? And if that wasn't a classic TSN turning point yesterday, when the Ticats can't score any other way, can't move the ball, and Poppy White goes 92 <laughs> yards and puts them on uh, on the scoreboard and turns the game around as well as Dane Evans did by, uh, by entering the game as the, uh, as the quarterback, um, man, everything, everything changed in those, uh, yeah. however long it took them to run 92 yards. And, um, as I say, it should have been the TSN turning point, but I didn't hear anybody say that. Can I, can I mention Jeff Reinbolt for a moment? Real quick, real quick. He doesn't quick. get mentioned very often. Um, he's a special teams coach of the Hamilton Ticats, used to be a head coach in the CFL. He's a real character. has been around the league forever. Bombers. Every, Bombers head coach. Every big game, it seems, the Ticats do something very well on special teams. That's Jeff, right. Jeff Reinbold's a real treasure in the CFL. Uh, well, I, I kind of thought maybe we'd uh, get to the uh, baseball lockout and chat about that, but uh, <laughs> I suspect uh, it'll be around long enough that we can and maybe invite you guys back on to uh, address that subject. I I'm in very intrigued, especially well with both of you to hear what you have to say about that, but we can't do it today. Time is our enemy. We thank you both uh, for uh, taking a few minutes for us uh, today. All the best. And uh, hopefully we'll talk before the holidays, but if not um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, etc. Thank you. David. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Steve. Same to everybody. So. John and I'll be back after these messages. Well, our thanks to Hodge and Simmons. You ask, I, I think we probably asked fewer questions in that in interview conversation than almost any other show we've done, right? You think? <laughs> well, I always, you know, I, I, you know, all the roundtables that we did while, while um, we were on radio, I always said the best roundtables are the ones where I say the least. Mm, yeah. Because, you, and it doesn't happen very often when people, the other people around the table, will work off each other. Well, and the other thing is, is that what's great about both of those guys is, is that uh, their, their sports knowledge is broad. Um, and th there's a real comfort factor that uh, they can play off each other really well. So uh, they've worked together themselves on Dave's old reporter show, if you recall. Um, so from that perspective, it, uh, it makes uh, life easy. I was actually going to bring up uh, one, one thing from yesterday in the NFL was, John Harbaugh going for a two point conversion. Uh, last yeah, trying to win game. rather than play for the tie. Well, I mean, you're going to go to overtime if you play. Well, and, yeah. So, I mean, and, and to me, uh, the old NFL, it, it would have been just kick the kick the convert and and we'll we'll play the extra time. But 
He actually said after, he said, Listen, <laughs> we are so banged up. I have no cornerbacks left. <laughs> and, you know, if we win, we win. I mean, Baltimore is a good team. They're going to make the playoffs. He put the he put his he put the ball in the hands of of one of the best players in the in the NFL in in Jackson, and if we win, great. Well, Harbaugh bragging rights um, go to the brother in uh, Michigan, who finally beat Ohio State and now is uh, going to go to the semifinal for a chance at a national title. Yeah, Georgia, they're going to play Georgia, and then it's going to be Alabama and Cincinnati. I'm cheering for the Bearcats. I've become well, every, a, I'm a Bearcats it? fan now. Well, if you're not a fan of Michigan or Georgia or Alabama, I'm cheering for the Bearcats. Who you who I guarantee you've never seen play a whole game. I agree. I agree. Am I wrong? No, you're you're not wrong. You're no. not wrong. And I I concede. Me too. Twelve and zero. I think they are though. Yeah, they are. Now, we'll see whether wins over the sisters of the poor, and Nick and Tony, <laughs> and maybe William and Mary, um, relate well, to being hey, listen, Georgia. Alabama two weeks ago played next New Mexico State. So don't. Oh, I uh, I get on. it. That's the whole come point. On. You know their schedule. Yeah. With due respect hasn't been tough no but they're undefeated and you do that you should get to a championship game. well and we gotta get out of here i know okay i like right. college i love college football these days it's been fun to watch i'm glad um you want to tell us or the audience tomorrow yeah we're, we didn't get to baseball and so we're going to do baseball tomorrow buck martini is going to come in and talk oh, about good. uh his uh his labor experiences and then his perception of what's going on with the lockout not a work stoppage lockout in major league baseball well, first in a long, long time, and Buck, fortuitously for us, was around when the when there were a bunch of lockouts, and he was a uh, a player. He was rep, a rep, yeah, and intimately involved. So I'll be intrigued to hear what he has to say tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Until then, y'all have yourself a good day. Uh, stay dry. Watch out for the wind, and um, we'll provide some breeze, if not wind, tomorrow. See you then. Bye bye.